All right, a uh, very good afternoon and uh, welcome um, everyone to this um, afternoon's uh, guest lecture session. So um, this is uh, technically a um, lecture session intended for the class of uh, fisheries agriculture, a third year class in the University of Malaya. But we have with us also some um, invited guests. So. Um, we have um, some interns uh, from UCSI and I believe are from uh, UPM Bintulu. And I also have a postgraduate student with us who's uh, interested in looking at some aquaculture issues. So welcome everyone uh, this afternoon. So we have with us a very um, special guest. Um, I will not uh, be taking up her thunder uh, by doing too long an introduction, but I want to uh, welcome uh, Miss Erin Tan uh, into our virtual uh, environment here. Um, so Erin is uh, currently the managing director of a relatively new um, aquaculture and uh, consultancy company called uh, Three Little Fish. And um, before that, I got to know Erin um, way back when we were doing um, our undergraduate in University of Malaya, that's like um, ages ago. And Erin uh, has always been a very good friend and uh, she is uh, currently just got appointed as the secretary for MADA. Um, um, suddenly it, it, skipped, uh, it slipped my mind. Can you remind me again, Erin, what, uh, what does MADA stand for? The Malaysian Aquaculture Development Association. Thank you. Okay, so she just got appointed um, as uh, this uh, in this um, um, a prestigious um, aquaculture association, which is uh, looking um, at uh, broadly at uh, um, aquaculture development and the uh, issues in Malaysia. And if you're interested, you know, please uh, use this opportunity, okay, to um, ask any questions uh, related to um, the aquaculture industry. And also, um, um, she might be mentioning, you know, opportunities for internship with the company after this. Okay, so um, uh, with that, I will pass the time over to you, Erin. Take it away. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Ah, please, no doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long, long time now we've known each other. Anyway, um, welcome everybody to uh, my little talk uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Amy, for letting me have this opportunity to share uh, what little I know uh, and also my experiences in aquaculture. Um, so without further ado, let me share my screen and uh, let's get the talk going. Sounds good. Here we go. Is it sharing? Yes, I can see my face uh, right in the middle. <laughs> okay, we're good now. Okay, right. Um, so uh, let me just change the, okay. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about aquaculture and uh, current issues. Aquaculture is a very wide topic um, and there are many, many issues in aquaculture. Uh, each of uh, the issues that I mentioned actually warrants very, very in-depth uh, discussion and uh, we can talk for hours about each uh, issue. So however, because we are short of time today, um, I'll just keep everything fairly brief and uh, I will talk um, more in depth about one issue which is close to my heart. Okay, so I'm just uh, going to start now. My name is Erin and I have a background in fish breeding, fish health and diseases. I graduated with a Bachelor of uh, Science in Biotech uh, in UM in 2002. So I'm like your super senior. Apologies, phone call. <laughs> Um, and uh, I uh, graduated with the MSc of Zoology from uh, University of Guelph in Canada in 2005. My thesis was entitled uh, towards a, a DNA vaccine against salmonic cryptobiosis. So I have been involved in aquaculture ever since 1997, which is around 24 years now. And in 2018, together with my partner, I established Three Little Fish and we are trading in aquaculture products. I am also, uh, in effect, uh, a fish health consultant. Sorry, Erin, I'm just going to jump in uh, real quick. Um, you actually have your slides on. I think it's the um, speaker's view. Um, oh. So you... <laughs> oh, my God. 
oh okay so that's really oh well no oh, worries right sorry yeah no no worries okay no present a view okay <laughs> perfect looks good now <laughs> all right so three little fish is we saw distributor for sindel's premier breeding hormones our most famous hormone is overprim, which is a potent ovulation hormone for freshwater fish. Overplant is uh, to another hormone, but it's the same hormone, except it's a different format, and it's used for managing uh, the breeding schedule of marine fish or large fish. So apart from breeding hormones, we also have anesthetics, disinfectants, screen tests, and the screen test kits. Um, do check us out on Shopee. We are available there uh, and you can uh, purchase test kits uh, from there. So apart from that, we also do commercialization of innovative Malaysian inventions. Uh, our current one is Break and Protect 2, which is a marine leech device meant to break the life cycle of marine leeches and to manage uh, parasites like leeches. Uh, in the sea cages without use of uh, chemicals. Another commercialization that we're doing right now is the Shrimp Detect PCR kit for shrimp diseases. This actually is a UM invention uh, done by Dr. Suba in uh, University of Malaya. So uh, a few pictures about what I do. Uh, I inject fish, I get them to spawn, um, I get to handle a lot of fish, I do uh, microbiology work, and I do a lot of dissection. Aquaculture is the farming of aquatic animals, including finfish, crustaceans, mollusks, etc., and aquatic plants, mostly algae or seaweed, using or within freshwater, seawater, brackish water, and inland saline water. So aquaculture is a wide, uh, wide topic and there are many, many issues. <clears throat> I'll just go briefly over some of them. So aquaculture is divided into two uh, main uh, sectors, which is the mariculture or marine culture and the freshwater aquaculture. So marine culture can be land-based uh, or sea-based, so in ponds or sea cages. Freshwater is usually land-based in ponds or cages, uh, in the rivers, or in recirculating systems uh, that can be housed in buildings. Feed in aquaculture is a huge uh, sector. Uh, there are many types of feed. Right now, um, the main uh, feed are functional feeds, alternative proteins, sustainable feeds, and of course, additives in feeds. Environmental and sustainability issues. I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of uh, the many environmental issues surrounding aquaculture, uh, from deforestation to siltation of uh, waterways because of uh, digging of ponds and building of uh, aquaculture uh, areas. Um, um, sustainability is, uh, for example, like um, whether the monoculture of, of whatever we are culturing, is it sustainable in the long run? So these are some of the issues that uh, we have to deal with in aquaculture. Human management is another issue. Uh, we have had issues of labor abuse, um, especially in the feed industry where uh, uh, workers were claimed to have not been paid fairly. Uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, marketing and uh, consumer awareness, whereby uh, we always try to have good aquaculture practices and whether these practices are uh, enough in terms of environmental and sustainability issues. So in Malaysia, we have a couple of uh, certifications. They are MyGAF and SPLAM. Internationally, there are many, some of which are the Global Gap, Safe Quality Food, Marine Stewardship Council, Shrimp Seal of Quality, and etc. Last but not least is uh, the aquaculture issue that is close to my heart, and that is diseases. 
I will talk about the diseases uh, issue uh, a little bit later on. Um, in 2018, uh, it was noted by the FAO that the capture fisheries had increased 5.4% from the pre average of previous three years to 96.4 million metric tons. As you can see in the, um, in the graph here, aquaculture is actually uh, pretty much on par with capture fisheries. And we all know that this is because that the capture fisheries are suffering. Um, we are not able to sustainably uh, harvest more fish, more and more fish from the oceans anymore. So aquaculture has to take up the slack. So um, in 2018 also, it was noted that the world aquaculture production had attained a record high of 114.5 million tons in live weight. Uh, the total farm gate sale value was 263.6 billion. Of this, 82.1 million tons were from aquatic animals, and these were mainly from carp, tilapia, and catfish. 32.4 million tons were from aquatic algae or seaweed production, and 26,000 tons from ornamental seashells and pearls. So here is a very nice uh, graph. Uh, which I found recently, just before the talk actually, uh, the composition of the global uh, live weight aquaculture production. So there was a comparison between uh, 1997 and 2017 and how the ratios of aquaculture animals have grown or uh, increased over the years. So we have definitely increased our production from 36 metric tons to 112 metric tons in the last 20 years. Um, a large part of it is seaweed, Japanese kelp and the yukima. But as you can see, uh, fish production has also increased over the years. And of course, the number of species of fishes have also increased. <clears throat> so the pros and cons of aquaculture. When you have a stable supply of um, fish, um, therefore, uh, more people are able to access the highly nutritious protein and micronutrients from fish protein. And uh, this causes the fish prices to be stable and perhaps lowered as time goes by. Fish protein is very important uh, for many people around the world uh, because uh, it is actually one of the more sustainably produced uh, proteins uh, when you compare to other kinds of uh, livestock. So uh, aquaculture also provides relief for wild aquatic stock. As I have mentioned before, um, the wild stock or wild caught fish in the oceans are no longer, um, we are no longer able to sustainably harvest from there. Uh, it was reported that uh, in 1974, um, we could harvest, the, it was sustainably being harvested at 90%, but as of 2017, the uh, percentage of biologically sustainably harvested uh, fish stock had dropped to 65.8%. <clears throat> Okay, so aquaculture is also a source of income and employment for locals and uh, supply of nutritious protein. Um, it produces less, well, less waste in regards to commercial fishing. Um, this point one is talking about how in commercial fishing, there is also a lot of uh, waste. In, for example, when you do drag fishing, um, there are a lot of cases where nets are abandoned in the oceans and this causes entanglement of the wildlife and the fish and turtles and other sea life will also uh, drown. So aquaculture will provide food security and uh, help to feed the world population. The cons of aquaculture. One of the main issues is water pollution. And uh, we can see this because um, when you are culturing something in high densities, then there's a lot of input of nutrients. And how this discharge of nutrients is handled has always been an issue. Recently in Malaysia, um, 
there have been cases where fish farms were closed because uh, they detected that the fish farmers had released uh, water that had high levels of ammonia into uh, water sources that were for the human consumption. So um, these farms were actually uh, fined and um, they were told to uh, either improve their systems or close down. So this is an ongoing uh, issue in uh, our Malaysian aquaculture for sure. Uh, habitat destruction or mangrove destruction. Uh, as you know, the mangrove is very important, is an important habitat for um, many types of uh, fish and shrimp and other kinds of uh, aquatic animals. So when you destroy mangroves, then you will have issues uh, with the, the nurseries being destroyed and not being able to renew the numbers of uh, aquatic animals in the wild. Um, <clears throat> so uh, diseases, uh, pests from fish farms may spread to the wild population. However, this is also true in the reverse. Uh, sometimes when you culture a mono species and uh, you have a lot of wild animals around you, uh, the wild animals can actually also bring uh, pests and diseases to your uh, culture and because your culture is very close contact with each other, um, the disease can spread very quickly and cause uh, massive mortalities and economic loss. Um, we have also some irresponsible and indiscriminate use of antibiotics and chemicals. Um, <clears throat> I think this one, uh, a lot of uh, fish farmers and shrimp farmers. Uh, they are very careful about this now because uh, there's a lot of pushback um, and people understand that you cannot simply use chemicals and antibiotics. So many farmers are aware of this and they take steps to try and do things uh, using less chemicals, uh, not using uh, antibiotics prophylactically, only for treatments. And after that, making sure that the minimum residue levels are met uh, before the water is released into uh, our waterways. However, there are always some wild cards and uh, they are the ones that <coughs> give aquaculture a bad name. <laughs> um, all right, the, the other con is fish feed is partially made out of fish protein. Uh, this used to be true um, many years ago where fish feed was a lot made out of fish protein. And so it wasn't sustainable in that sense because if you were taking lots of fish from the ocean to feed your fish that you were culturing, then um, you're not being very sustainable in the end. So currently there's a lot of research uh, being done as to the use of uh, alternative feeds, uh, alternative proteins using plants, using insect meal, and there's been much headway on, on this. And so uh, we are seeing fish feed becoming uh, much more sustainable these days. Um, <clears throat> unfavorable public opinion of aquaculture fish and practices. Uh, so many people think that fish or shrimp from uh, cultured ponds and cages don't taste as good, don't uh, have a good mouthfeel, uh, they have a bad smell, um, maybe they're not as nutritious as wild caught fish. However, nowadays, uh, as I previously mentioned about the fish feed, um, fish feed is now very, very advanced and aquaculture fish can be actually even more nutritious than their wild caught counterparts. Uh, this has been shown from some uh, a study on uh, salmon and trout, whereby the levels of EPA and DHA are much higher compared to their local uh, to the wild caught counterparts. Um, the other issue is um, most uh, many of the uh, wild caught fish are actually high in dioxins or PCBs and heavy metals, and um, so that 
that's not necessarily uh, healthier for you to consume. And the other thing is uh, wild caught fish are often riddled with uh, parasites and diseases and uh, because they've never been treated. So you could be taking a chance there, uh, having all the parasites uh, in the fish. <clears throat> and uh, last but not least, uh, another issue is the containment of culture species. Um, there have been many cases where uh, a cage is breached, whether by human error or uh, weather. Um, sometimes when the weather is very uh, inclement, um, the cage can actually break uh, and release uh, our culture species into the uh, environment. Um, okay, so let's move on. Diseases in fishes. So this is my pet uh, topic. Uh, this is something that I studied and I am uh, dealing with with all my farmers and my, my colleagues. Um, so parasites are the primary cause of disease, but they usually live in harmony with the host. Um, however, until some sort of stress causes imbalance and then you'll have a parasite uh, outbreak. Bacteria and fungus, on the other hand, are secondary causes of disease, but they are fast spreading and can cause massive losses in mortality or loss of value. So in this picture here, you can see all these nodules, these awful, awful looking nodules. They're actually the caligus or sea lice nodules in the mouth cavity of grouper fish. Okay, so they will hatch out into hundreds of little sea lice and uh, then they will attach themselves to the inner part of uh, the grouper where it's safe and, and shielded from the outside environment and proceed to uh, feed on the mucus and the blood of the fish from inside its mouth. So the more parasites causing lesions in the protective layer of fish, the higher chance of bacterial and fungal infection. So now I'd like to do a little case study uh, of uh, one of my customers' uh, fish having problems. So oftentimes I get calls from my customers. My fish is dying. Help me. <laughs> so first thing that I, I need to do usually is I need to ask uh, about the symptoms and potential causes of, uh, of uh, the issue. So in this case, the fish were not feeding, they were not swimming normally, they were gathering at the side of the pond listlessly. Uh, the number of mortality was increasing daily. Um, after dissection and observation, you could see that the liver of the fish is pale and enlarged. Okay. Uh, the bile duct is also miscolored. Okay. And uh, you can see the fish looks like it's bleeding. Okay, so this is called petechia or pinpoint bleeding on the surface of the fish. So this is bleeding underneath the scales. Okay, you won't be able to wipe off the blood. It's actually underneath the scale and it's bleeding on the skin of the fish. So we also did some uh, checking of the fish on uh, under the microscope and uh, we found lots of monogenians. Monogenians are an ectoparasite flatworm that can move about freely on the fish's body surface, feeding on mucus and epithelial cells of the skin and gills. Okay? So they're found all over the fish, from the tail to the skin uh, to the gills. Okay? So this one is a Dactyldiarus, and it has hooks and suckers. These little black dots are its eyes. So clinical signs of monogenian infection. So as I've mentioned, you will see bleeding under the scales. Uh, the fish are lethargic, pale gill, they are swollen, uh, they, are, they have clamped fins. They swim near the surface and are uh, gasping for air. They, they do not feed well. And sometimes you will see scale loss or lesions on the surface of uh, this, the fish. Right, so 
Apart from that, if we go back, if you see these red parts here, it's a sign that there is a bacterial infection. Okay, so uh, a common bacteria that is found in all waterways is Aeromonas hydrophila. So this bacteria causes motile Aeromonas septicemia, and it can cause high mortalities and economic losses in the fish. So uh, the clinical signs are pale gills, lack of appetite, exophthalmia, which is pop eye, where the fish's eyes uh, pop out because of uh, imbalance in internal pressure of the fish. Uh, the fish are swimming abnormally. You can see ulcerations in the skin of the fish, uh, accumulation of fluid in the scale pockets, bloated appearance. So this uh, bloated appearance is because of the accumulation of ascites in the belly of the fish. It is usually a yellowish liquid, and if you cut open the fish, then all this yellow liquid will come out. Okay, so and reddening of the skin. <clears throat> so the treatment for monogenian and um, and the uh, aromonas. So I told my customer to reduce the feed by fifty percent, and to treat with trichloroform, which is an organophosphate, which is used to um, kill uh, parasites like uh, Lernia, Argulus, and also monogenians, okay? And the addition of quasi-quanta into feed, that's an anti Um Last but not least, which is very important, we need to send uh, samples to the lab for confirmation. So my farmer sent it to UPM, and they did uh, post-mortem and direct smear analysis and they found the same things that I had observed before, which was the enlarged uh, hemorrhagic skin, uh, enlarged livers, pale and fragile, uh, dactylogyrus or monogenians, and also aromonas. So the key thing uh, for most farmers is um, when they have done treatment, they must be patient because we need to give uh, the time for the medicines to work. Um, the next slide uh, I'll show you. So these were the mortality rates. Um, the farmer had started to see mortality starting to double around the 10th of February. And uh, the numbers were going up quite quickly um, until the 22nd of February. And, and by this time, he was panicking. Um, so I had told him to treat with trichloroform and he had put that on the 23rd. Um, but the numbers kept on climbing. And this is normal because uh, when the fish had an outbreak of parasites and also bacterial infection, the weak ones are going to die. Um, treating them with the medicines may actually kill them a little bit faster, the weak ones. However, the healthier ones, they will survive and they will uh, get better eventually. What we, what we need to do is just give it some time. So by the 28th, um, numbers had climbed to around the 4,000 region. And uh, my customer was uh, panicking and uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he was nearly in tears by then already. Um, so on the 1st of March, I agreed that he could do the trichloroform again because um, trichloroform is an organophosphate uh, pesticide and uh, we cannot uh, use this indiscriminately. It has a shelf life, uh, a half life of uh, about seven to 10 days. So once we have dosed it once, you cannot add it again uh, in, within the week. So on the first, I agreed that it was okay to add it in and uh, the numbers kept on climbing but by the third of the month, um, the numbers had started to plateau. My customer was not uh, really convinced at that time, but I told him that he needed to be patient and just give it some more time. And so finally, the numbers started to come down. And uh, by the middle of the month, uh, the pond had gone back to its normal mortality rates. Um, it's normal to have some mortality uh, on any given day. Uh, when you are culturing fish, uh, 
normally for tilapia, you would see 10 to 20 pieces of mortality every day. And that is normal. What is not normal is when the numbers start to get into the hundreds and then start doubling as, as you go, okay, on a daily basis. Okay, so his treatment was triclofon, praziquantel, and uh, OTC. So what are the factors that can cause a disease outbreak to happen? Uh, the main one is overcrowding and uh, stress on the fish. Okay. Inadequate biosecurity is another important one. So when you have uh, new fish, you must quarantine them, you must uh, observe them or give them a disinfectant treatment so that they are, uh, at least you reduce the numbers of pathogens that you're adding into your pond, right? Um, other forms of uh, biosecurity that you need to observe are, for example, uh, if you have animals in the area, fish, dogs, cats, all these can bring pathogens into your pond. And so you should uh, make sure that they do not uh, enter your pond if possible. Um, deterioration of water quality. This usually happens when there's overfeeding and uh, the animal uh, cannot finish the feed properly. And so then there's a lot of excess nutrients in the uh, pond bottom. So unless you can clean that uh, properly, then that will lead to high ammonia, and nitrites in the water, which is very detrimental to the health of your fish. Uh, the next factor would be weather. Uh, inclement weather, for example, extreme hot, uh, extreme heat, uh, weeks on end with no rain, or, or the, other, the other side of things uh, where you have a week of rain, unrelenting rain, rain from morning till night. All these can actually stress out the fish because when the weather is too cold or too hot, it, they affect the fish in the pond and they cause a stress in the fish. Uh, aggressive tank behavior by tank mates or pond mates. Uh, so yes, when the fish gather together, especially like during feeding times, uh, then they are liable to scratch each other because their fins are quite sharp. So when you have breach the protective layer of uh, the skin or the scale, then there's more chance of the bacteria and fungus uh, infecting your fish. So how do you prevent and control? Minimize the stress factors, uh, observe propping stock, uh, proper stocking levels, uh, improve and have excellent biosecurity, quarantine your fish every single time. I cannot stress this enough. This in fact, new hashlings. And perhaps you can also think about using anesthesia during handling when you are shipping your fish, when you are grading your fish. Anesthesia will cause them to struggle less and then there'll be less injury to the protective layer of the fish. Okay. So that's it for my pet uh, topic of diseases. Um, let's go back to aquaculture. <laughs> uh, the future of aquaculture. So uh, definitely the future is to look at alternative uh, feed sources. We need to lessen the use of fish to grow fish. And so um, many companies are now researching the use of insect meal uh, as an alternative protein uh, for fish, and they have found very good results. Uh, it can be, uh, it can replace up to 40% of the protein required uh, for fish. The use of uh, recirculating aquaculture systems, this has uh, been around for quite a while, um, but every, every year or every, every time there are modifications and improvements on monitoring systems and uh, how to build the systems. So more and more people are looking at recirculating aquaculture systems because water is definitely another finite resource. And so we must do everything we can to protect it. Protect it. Um, genetic modification, uh, perhaps to produce fish that are more nutritious, um, 
can handle diseases better and perhaps grow faster. Um, farmers have actually done this, but on a more uh, on a slower scale, because uh, when you choose fish fish that are faster growing and you use that as your breeding stock, then that is already um, choosing uh, faster growing fish. When you choose fish that have withstood diseases, then you're already choosing fish that can withstand diseases more. Genetic modification on this hand will just speed things up. Integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. So this is polyculture or the use of different types of uh, fishes in the same aquaculture system. So for example, you can culture fish with a uh, bottom feeder and then with a filter feeder like mollas or oysters. And one more would be to use uh, seaweed or algae to filter out the water. So all this can be done in the same system. You can have seawater systems, you can have uh, freshwater systems. The, a very famous uh, example is uh, to culture fish in paddy fields. So there you are culturing fish as well as rice. So integrated multi-trophic aquaculture is definitely becoming the future, although it has been widely practiced um, in other countries. And uh, we can definitely learn from uh, countries like China. They have been doing uh, IMTA for many, many decades now. Uh, the use of bacteria to culture fish. Okay. Uh, probiotics or beneficial bacteria can be added to uh, the feed to improve uh, feed digestibility, to improve uh, the health of the fish, the gut health of the fish. And it can also be added into the water to maintain good water quality and to also hasten the breakdown of uh, organics in the pond. And of course, last but not least, technology is the future of aquaculture. Um, right now, many companies are integrating AI, they're integrating systems that can monitor uh, the fish uh, being fed, the health of the fish, uh, the water inputs, the water parameters, all these are with the use of technology. And uh, the recirculating aquaculture systems, they use a lot of this uh, technology in their systems. But we are starting to see more and more farmers uh, outdoors uh, using technology to uh, culture their fish. Um, so this is uh, a Malaysian company, Life Origin, and they have uh, manufactured uh, defatted DSF uh, black soldier fly larvae meal. So they believe in regenerative agriculture, whereby they take organic waste and then they feed it to the black soldier fly larvae and produce feed for human consumption or protein supplements, feed for the pet food and fish and animal feeds. Um, they can also produce uh, organic fertilizer for agriculture. So black soldier fly larvae has a stable protein uh, level of 60% and it's comparable to grade one fish meal. Okay, um, so as I've mentioned before, uh, black soldier fly larvae meal can replace up to 40% of protein requirements for fish. A little bit about uh, more about uh, aqu recirculating aquaculture systems and um, one country that has many, many companies who are looking into this is actually Singapore. Uh, Singapore has very little land, land space, right? So everything they do needs to be efficient. They need to utilize whatever land that they have to the maximum. So for example, Aquologics in Singapore produces marine shrimp, uh, seawater tilapia and microalgae, and they use systems to uh, measure all the inputs into their system. Okay, so this one was uh, to do with the IMTA. Uh, Apollo Group in Singapore, they are building an eight-story high uh, recirculating indoor system. Uh, another company that is using AI and robotics to monitor water quality, feed dispersion, uh, water inputs, um, shunting fish from different sections to reduce uh, the stress on fish during grading. 
is Singapore Aquaculture Technologies. So the digitalization of data collection and input reduces the human error and provides accurate historical data. Historical data is actually very important uh, whenever uh, something happens uh, to the system, if a disease outbreak happens. Um, for example, uh, the case of my farmer's tilapia. Not many farmers actually uh, do data uh, collection like that. My this farmer is uh, ex the exception to the case. Uh, because he did uh, data collection, um, he was able to tell immediately or almost immediately that something was happening in his pond. Why were his numbers uh, of mortalities uh, increasing? Um, many farmers, actually, if you don't have that, uh, by the time they realize something is happening, uh, the mortality would usually be very far gone and sometimes too late for us to do anything. So data is very important. Um, so the use of uh, AI and robotics and uh, recirculating agriculture system eventually will require less human labor. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. So this is my team and uh, my partners in life and everything good and bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I am uh, hiring interns. So uh, do drop me an email if uh, you are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. How was it? Good. I'm seeing my face now, so uh, maybe what you'll do is uh, unshare and then uh, turn your camera back on and then we'll have a Q&A session. Um, thanks, Erin. That was uh, very interesting. I mean, I have uh, given a similar talk, but you know, this is all out of the brain, but you're the one, you know, that's in the industry and uh, oh. actually working, you know, uh, down on the ground with um, 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 the, the farmers. So we have uh, time for about uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. So I have uh, seen uh, two questions uh, that we have uh, in the chat box, but I thought, you know, I wanted to um, um, ask you uh, a little bit more about some of your um, 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 uh, the, the topic that you've shared, you know, particularly regarding um, the, the disease. So um, I looked with fascination with your um, mortality rates that you uh, presented. You know, it almost looks like COVID-19 statistics, you know, and then... Uh, I was thinking too. <laughs> I hope we can achieve, uh, you know, the number drop just like my farmer in two weeks. <laughs> well, I think uh, Dr. Norhisha mentioned uh, three to four months, but anyway, we, we won't go, um, we won't go there. Uh, but it's really it's really quite fascinating uh, uh, the, the numbers that you show. So you you did mention, you know, there is a baseline uh, mortality that's to be expected anyway on a day to day basis. Right. Um, so if um, if I imagine that, you know, if um, the, the the numbers did look quite alarming, uh, I imagine that, you know, I can understand why your tilapia farmer would uh, be panicking, but had um, he not intervened, uh, and I think it was at day 23 only, um, he started the treatment itself, right? Then I assume that, you know, uh, we can go to a situation where it will be um, complete mortality. Um, um, well, I think you probably have like 90% mortality. Mm. There will be some fishes that will survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start with uh, um, some of the questions that we have the chat box. So uh, Nizam is asking, uh, and I'm not sure whether you know the answer off the top of your head, um, but are there any guidelines by Department of Fisheries for aquaculture in a mangrove area in order to minimize the destruction of our mangrove forest and water pollution? Is this um, um, something you, you know off the top of your hand? I don't have like, uh, I don't have exact answers, but um, actually most aquaculture areas are done in uh, aquaculture zones. So they're gazetted for aquaculture, right? Um, so whether DOF has specific, uh, I'm sure they have specific uh, guidelines as to how much mangrove can be cut down and so on and so forth. Yes, that one I think you, you can probably ask uh, DOF um, but uh, the impact and all that, we I don't know. 
Okay. Well, I'll just uh, comment quickly on that, you know, based on my limited knowledge. So anytime, you know, before you actually um, clear a mangrove area, uh, depending on the size of the farm, etc., you know, you, there might be a need for um, environmental impact assessment. And uh, throughout this um, impact assessment, you know, there are um, uh, kind of considerations, you know, for um, the kind of impact that would happen if you actually do clear this amount of mangrove, you know, to, um, uh, uh, well, to, to create the farm that you know uh, you want to and the mitigation uh, part you know would be the um, have to be um, assessed you know by the environmental consultants and in this part I believe that's where you know um, uh, Department of Fisheries you know Department of Forestry Department of Environment you know there are those um, different uh, guidelines so um, uh, hopefully that answers your um, question Nizam uh, in some sense so it's um, it's this is a a situation where you know the jurisdiction just goes beyond fisheries right um, because you're talking about you know a uh, use of an area in mangroves that uh, depending whether it's a mangrove reserve or not that will be under department of forestry uh, if it's not under department of forestry you know who knows um, who's yeah. regulating that yeah because we have state uh, regulatory correct yeah yeah, and you mentioned about um aquaculture zone. So I I know for example there are um designated aquaculture zones, but um I assume that's under the purview of a uh, department of fisheries, right? Um yeah. yeah, I know less about aquaculture, but more on the fisheries part. And um, do you know how aquaculture zones or where areas are suitable um are being identified? I have no idea oh, how to okay. identify it. No. All but, right. Uh, I do know that there are. There are zones already set up, many of them, all mm. over the country, yeah. Okay, all right. So we have a question by Azrul. Um, how can we enhance fish immunity system other than via genetic modification? Um, you can enhance it by giving proper feed supplements. Just like human beings, fish also need vitamins and micronutrients. Uh, so keeping them healthy by giving them the right like macro and micronutrients is very important. Um, the other thing is uh, to try and reduce the stress on the fish. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you think about uh, humans getting stressed, you know, fish can also get stressed as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's not like they can escape too, right? Especially if they are um, uh, cultured or, you know, trapped in like a cage area. <laughs> COVID circulating, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, I, I think it's a... Uh, uh, I, I haven't seen any other questions in the chat box and um, I wanted to um, ask you, Erin, um, um, uh, if you can rank, you know, the most... Um, a solvable immediate problem the aquaculture industry has. Um, what 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 do you think that might be? All I mean, it's it's a lot of challenges, right? You highlight all the this. issues are so big, so big. Um, the one that always, uh, you know, that I feel that I can do something about, and and that I think we all can, especially in Malaysia, is actually the training of more uh, disease and disease people. Because we, I, have, I find a huge lack in, in, that, uh, in that area. Uh, we don't have people who can uh, quickly diagnose a disease or, or check on the health of the fish, you know. Um, most farmers are operating blind they operate on the just feel the, their guts you know i feel my fish is okay <laughs> oh boy i taste no no, no science okay. involved huh? <laughs> you know so <laughs> and there are a lot of vets being produced right like vets take care mm. of the health of livestock right our industries you know our chicken our 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 cow industries you know so Vets are there to look after uh, the livestock. But what about the fish and shrimp? Where are the vets to look after the aquatic animals? There are very few of us. I can probably name five people who, you know, on my hand, uh, who, who can do this, you know. Um, we need to set up more labs uh, and we need to have more technically trained people in the, in the farm or uh, in extension works so that Farmers have 
place to turn to because I can't help every single family. And I'm also not equipped uh, to help them to do anything beyond basic uh, detection of pathogens, right? Um, I don't have a lab to do micro, microbiological works, uh, virological works. All these is important for fish health as well, you know? So yeah, I think that one is something that we can all work towards, you know? University students, anybody? <laughs> I, I would issue this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably not the the <laughs> right group, but you know, there's. I don't think there's any right or wrong. I think that you know, um, the there's always opportunity. Masters, you know, PhD to look at, you know, some of the other things. And it really sounds like you've hit on the nail, you know, on an um, an obvious need and lack, you know, that the aquaculture industry has, you know, and the opportunity to um, address this. Right. Um. This is really kind of, uh, you know, quite a um. Uh, uh, it's, it's not totally, it's not impossible at all, right? This is a kind of actually it's really quite routine, it's, right? right? It's, yeah. In many countries, we have a lot of uh, technically trained people and, and basically it's required uh, on every farm to have somebody who can do disease diagnosis, you know, quick pathogen identification so that they know what steps to take, right? So like my farmer, because he he did uh, his recording, right? So he knew immediately when something was wrong. Oh, it, mortality went from 20 to 45, 45 to uh, 80. Okay, something is wrong. Immediately he calls me. Huh? Luckily, he knows me to call me also. <laughs> but if... So, and because I'm experienced, uh, I know what questions to ask him. I, I know, okay, tilapia, uh, these are the common diseases for tilapia. This is the first thing you should check. And I've also advised him that he needs to uh, do regular treatments for parasites, right? So we need to uh, maintain low levels of parasites in the system, right? Because you're doing uh, monoculture, high density. Even if you have a few parasites, that can quickly bloom into thousands and millions of parasites. Oof. So he knows that he has to follow a scheduled uh, treatment plan for his fish. And he has been doing it. However, sometimes, like I said, because of stress, because of weather, because, you know, uh, overfeeding, uh, water quality deterioration, then something has triggered the outbreak of the parasites. But at least he knew when that change happened and he could take early steps and not only call me when, oh, I'm seeing 5,000 mortalities every day. Oh, tomorrow is 10,000. So by that time, actually, it's very difficult for me to Ooh. help. Mm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, um, uh, we have, um, well, I'm going to close um, this session by um, asking uh, perhaps one more question. So um, congratulations again on your appointment um, as secretary to MADA. I'm wondering in, you know, in your uh, new role uh, in MADA, what do you see that, you know, um, you would like to uh, contribute, you know, to, um, uh, um, uh, to, you know, the advancement of agriculture through your um, new role in MADA? Well, MADA has, uh, has many members and uh, everybody has uh, many concerns and many issues. So MADA tries to help everybody. Um, whatever issues are current in uh, our Malaysian uh, farmers, then that's what we try to do. Lah. So, yeah. Sounds very exciting. Uh, big problems, Erin, um, and I hope that, you know, um, we are among the um, students, you know, or our, our blossoming, uh, well, I don't know, uh, what, whatever your path to say, if anyone is, you know, interested uh, to know more or have the opportunity to be trained, you know, please don't um, uh, hesitate to reach out to Erin. Um, um, I think you have your um, email address, do you think you want to just uh, type it uh, quickly, Erin, in the uh, chat box so that they can uh, reach out to you? So um, please uh, uh, do um, reach out to Erin if you um, are interested, you know, in internship opportunities in her uh, company, okay? Um, uh, and, you know, I'm sure that she will be happy, you know, to uh, give you this um, opportunity to learn from her, you know, and other and network with some other people in Manda as well. So with this, um, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Erin, for your time. So 
Um, I hope that, you know, um, all of the um, students here and interns, you know, have uh, benefited and learned from this uh, sharing time. So thank you again, everyone. Um, I will take care and uh, see you all stay safe during this uh, pandemic time. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Maybe Thanks, Erin. I can't type in the chat. It's not allowed. Oh, okay. All right. No worries. Maybe I'll type it for you. Uh, what is the, what is the, your, your email address again? Erin. Three, Erin, huh? Three LF. 3L. 3LF, yep. Uh, sorry, 3L fish. Oh, 3L fish, huh? Okay. Dot com. Dot com. All right, got it. So uh, that is um, Erin's um, email address in the chat box there. So please uh, feel free to reach out to her as well. Okay, thank you, everybody. Take thank care. Everybody. Mm. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thank, thank you, Jinan. Thank you. Thank you.